Colleen. Yes, ma'am. I'd like to put somebody on the prayer list uh, to get her to do it. Okay. I, I met her in the doctor's office the other day when I was there. Okay. And she was talking about her Lord. And she, had, she said, I've been down some rough trails. And she okay. said, I'm really, I, 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 I blamed it on luck. Yeah. And I had bad luck. But she said, I came to the conclusion that it was not the luck that I was there. I was doing it to myself, and I was letting the devil work me over. Mm -hmm. And she said, and I, and I think so much that God is there for me now because she said, I went through the drug trail. I went through every filthy thing in the you can think of, and he still accepted me. Amen. So, Amen. And she Amen. Said, Ain't we got a good oh, God? Do you have yeah. a name for her? Oh. I don't know because they called me in the back at about that time when I was at my heart doctor and, and they called me back there for to finish talk to her and I told her, I said, he loves you. And she says, I know. Yeah, amen, amen. amen. Okay, yes sir, brother. I was just gonna ask if you had a name. Okay. I didn't, it was, she was a young woman about the 30s or so for a black girl and she was, she was sweet, adorable. And, yep. and she said that she was so proud. Yeah, yep. knows her name. Yes, he right. does. Yeah, he knows exactly who she is. Well, she she was just thrilled to death to know that she, and she said, and thank you for listening to me. And I said, okay. so proud to talk to her. You know, we come to Father's Day, and uh, I don't know about most of you guys, <laughs> but uh, I feel extremely unqualified to try to talk to somebody about being a father because, you know, Amen. <laughs> I've done such a lousy job of it, but uh, or I felt like I've done such a lousy job of it, but in spite of my worst efforts, my children seem to have turned out pretty decent. And so, you know, I thank God for a godly wife is what it amounts to. So. Amen. But uh, <clears throat> our scripture this morning is in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1, or, excuse me, 1 Thessalonians 2, 10 through 12, verses 10 through 12, three little short verses, but it's Paul talking to the church at Thessalonica, which was a, a, a Roman congregation, and they were brand spanking new Christians, they were children in Christ, and Paul had worked with them as a father works with his children, and that's the example that we have this morning of, of being a father. So if we begin in verse 10 of chapter 2, it says, You are witnesses, and so is God, how devoutly and uprightly and blamelessly we behaved toward you believers, just as you know how we were exhorting and encouraging and imploring each one of you as a father would his own children, so that you would walk in a manner worthy of the God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory, our most gracious God in heaven. Father, we see the example of what a true loving father should be as we look at you, Father, and we fall so miserably short. But Father, we thank you that you forgive us and that you encourage us and you exhort us and you Show us how to be better and that you don't give up on us as fathers. And God, I just ask you today to give me the words to say, to encourage our fathers, to show our fathers how they should behave, how they should act, what they should say, why they should be that way. And Father, just give us some insight today. Father, the most important task that you have given to us as men is that job of father and God we're so unworthy but through you we can do all things so just give us the grace give us the mercy give us the strength to be the father that we need to be Amen. God give me the words to all this in your precious holy name. Amen. 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 We notice the first thing Paul is telling the Thessalonians about his visit there and, and, and everything is that 
the first thing we see is that Paul walked the walk. His behavior was upright. It was blameless. It was, now he didn't say he was perfect. Guys, how many of you are perfect? Yeah, me neither. <laughs> yeah, I, I thought I was wrong once, but I was mistaken. mistaken. Yeah. No. But it's our, our behavior is the first thing that Paul mentions here. And have you ever noticed? I know, I know you have. Children are like sponges, aren't they? They see everything, don't they? They hear everything, and they want to emulate us, do they not? Amen. <coughs> Guys, you ever say a word that you probably should not order said? Amen. What's the first word out of your child's mouth as soon as you go back in the house and say mama? Daddy said. <laughs> right? Or they say the word when mama's standing there. Yeah, yeah. And where did you learn that word? Well, daddy said it. Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> Guys, your children are going to emulate and be exactly what you are. They are going to copy you. I don't care... You seen the picture of the great big old cowboy boots and the, the little two-year-old standing down inside of them? They're trying to fall into your footsteps, aren't they? Your children are going to behave and act and be a whole lot the way you are. Your actions speak thousands and thousands and thousands of words, so we have to be careful of how we act. Our children will learn, your son will learn how to treat women by the way you treat your wife. Your daughters will learn how they should expect to be treated by men by the way you treat your wife. Do you treat your wife the way you want your daughters to be treated? Men? How many of you got daughters? Do you treat your wife the way you want your daughter to be? My daughters are pretty doggone special. I promise you. And fortunately, both of them found a man that loves them and cherishes them and respects them and honors them and puts them up on a pedestal. My son has learned to treat his wife the way I treated my wife. And his sons are learning to treat their mother the way they need to treat their wife, by the way he treats them. It's the example that we set is excruciatingly important, guys. We are to guard every step every action, every word, every deed. They learn how to deal with situations, whether it's a financial crisis, whether it's hard times, it don't matter what they are, whether it's a health problem or a money problem or whatever, a work problem, they're going to learn how to deal with that by watching you. Are they not? And most of us don't do it well, do we? We do not do it well. But the good thing is our children can learn from our mistakes Amen. as well as from our successes, can they not? Amen. They can learn what not to do. Amen. Don't hit your thumb with that hammer, okay? <laughs> don't walk around in the dark without your shoes on because you might stumble over the coffee table. Okay? They, they can learn from our mistakes. But the thing is, we're going to make mistakes, aren't we? But the thing is, we need to be willing to admit that we made a mistake. We need to teach our children humility. Do we not? 
We need to teach them that we can make a mistake and that we're going to have to take care of that mistake, clean it up, and then go forward from there. But our actions are excruciatingly important. They're going to learn their morality from us. If we are <laughs> conniving and cheating and stealing at work, that's what our children are going to learn today. Or if we're, you know, just lazy and, you know, whining and griping and complaining all the time, guess what our children are going to be? And ladies, I'm going to tell you, yes, I'm talking to the men this morning, but you have a huge influence on them too. This is not just for the men. We can all learn from this. Your job in life is to teach those children. And everything you do, every step you take, every move you make is going to influence those children. Your actions will speak far louder than words. It's been proposed. I've heard some psychologists say that a person will remember 90% of what they see and only about 30-ish percent of what they hear. So what you do, the actions you do are speaking volumes. You know, one picture is worth a thousand words. One action is worth a million, okay? So guys, we've got to guard our steps. We've got to guard our actions. We have to be constantly thinking about what we're doing and how we're doing it and what we are representing to our yeah. children. Yeah. We've got to walk the walk. Colossians 1 and 10, it says, walk in a manner worthy of the Lord to please him in all respects bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. That's what we're supposed to do, guys. Walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. You know, Paul said he was tried to walk blamelessly. He did not say he walked perfectly, but he walked blamelessly. He was always walking in a manner that was worthy of God. And guys, that's what we are supposed to do. That is the example that has been set for us. <coughs> How? We are to walk and behave in front of our children. If you beat your wife, your kids are probably going to beat their wife. If you show your wife respect and honor and courtesy and understanding and appreciate her as a helper that God created her to be, I think that's maybe where we go next week is the family dynamic, okay? Then that's why you're sons will treat their wives. That's why your daughter will expect to be treated and that's the kind of man that they will be looking for. That's a tremendous load. That's a tremendous responsibility, isn't it? The second thing that he talks about here is we must talk the talk. It says, just as you know, we were exhorting and encouraging and imploring each one of you. They may not remember quite as much about what they hear. So we need to keep saying it over and over and over, don't we? We need to continually repeat everything. We, but our words must be number one. It must be consistent with our actions. I can tell my children be honest, tell the truth. But they see me over here fibbing and telling lies and covering things up. What are they going to remember? I can tell my children, love your wife, but I treat her terrible. What are my children going to remember? I can tell my children, work hard, but I don't. What are they going to remember? I can tell my children, honor God, but my life doesn't. What are they going to remember? Our actions and our words must match with each other, shouldn't they? Because they're going to remember more about what you do than what you hear. 
So I can tell you over and over and over and over and over and over and over again to do this, do this, do this. But if I don't behave that way myself, as the pastor of your church, I'm kind of your father, right? If I'm telling y'all one thing, but I'm acting another way, what do y'all going to consider to be the right way? Moms? Same thing goes for you, does it not? Our talk must be in line with our actions. Number two, it needs to be positive and encouraging words. Yes, we're going to have to discipline our children. We're going to have to tell our children no. In fact, if I remember correctly back there for many years, I told my children no a whole lot more than I told them yes. Why? Because kids are always wanting to, to push the limits. They're always wanting to push the boundaries. And for their sake, for their benefit, for their help, I had to tell them no. No, you do not need three bowls of ice cream right before lunchtime. <laughs> Two is a plenty. One after three. <laughs> You know, I didn't want chocolate chip cookies before lunch is okay, but ice cream, no. You know, I... <laughs> <coughs> but even when we discipline our children, we need to do it in a positive and encouraging and exhorting manner, should we not? Yes, you messed up, babe, but we can get through this. Yes, we've messed up, but... You can learn from this not to do this again. We need to do it in a positive manner, not just browbeat them, not just beat them down. We are to teach them and to train them in the Word of God. Our speech needs to be godly. Now, every word we say doesn't have to be, well, God says, well, God says. No, but we can teach biblical doctrines and biblical uh, truths through our common, ordinary, everyday speech. Well, yes, they don't behave exactly the way we do, but God created them, didn't he? They're one of God's children, so why are we more special than them? Or, you know, those types of languages. We need to let our speech show God. Because, unfortunately, we are the only God that they can see. Have you thought about that? You are representing God to your children. Yeah. That load's getting heavier and heavier, isn't it, guys? It's getting heavier and heavier, isn't it, moms? It's tough. Ephesians 6, 14, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. We're to teach them God's word. We're to show them God's word. We are to live a manner that demonstrates God, and we are to let our language emulate what God speaks to us and what does God tell us that he loves us, that he forgives us, that he's offered us grace, that he's offering us mercy. Yes, we're going to have to suffer the consequences for our actions, but he still loves us. Yes, he does not enjoy the things that we're doing, but he still loves us. That's what we need to show our children. That's what we need to teach our children. No matter how they behave, no matter how far they've gone away, we still love them. They still belong to us. And we still care about them. We still pray about them. Deuteronomy 6 and 7. I, I, I love this verse. Deuteronomy. Let me get back. Way back over there. This is in the Old Testament. Let's start in verse 6. These words which I am commanding you today. This is Moses speaking to the men of Israel. These words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently 
to your sons and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. First off, you need to know God's word so that you can teach God's word and everything you do, every, when you're sitting down at supper, when you're watching TV, if you're playing Nintendo, if you're in the backyard trying to swat a baseball, it all needs to be an opportunity to teach them about God's word. You know, when you pitch them the ball and they swing and miss and you can give them this scripture about missing the mark. Take advantage of those opportunities. Always be constantly, vigilantly looking for an opportunity to teach and to train your children about God and who he is and his words and his commandments. But you know what the secret to all of that was? Guys, you got to be there You've got to be there, don't you? I can't teach my children. I can't show my children if I'm not there, can I? <coughs> if I'm always gone, yes, guys, we got to work. We got to go provide for the household. But we need to spend time with the kids. We've got to juggle it, we've got to balance that. It's not as important what you can provide for them as what you do for them. I still remember my grandparents. My grandmother and my grandfather, both godly people, wonderful people. And every summer, they retired. They got to move down to Lake LBJ and lived right on the Lano River. And they had a boat dock out in the lake. They had a big old boat and, you know, had a little bitty boat too, a big boat. And when we'd go, my grandmother, she her front yard, she did not have grass. That was her garden. She had peas and squash and okra and black-eyed peas. I, I mean, she had it all in the garden. And we would go pick the peas, and we would go pick the okra, and we'd go get the green beans, and we'd all bring them in. She could. She did a lot of things for us. She did tons for us. When we sat down at the table, you remember the commercial about, here's the first turkey? Y'all remember that commercial? You know, that, you're hungry, you're hungry. You know, here's the first <laughs> when we would sit down at my grandmother's house, this was this is the third plate of meat, okay? This is the fourth cake. I mean, she could cook. She did things for us. My grandfather did things with us. He's the one that would take us out in the boat and go skiing. He's the one that takes us out in the little John boat. We'd go run the trot line. We'd go do a little fishing. We'd do that kind of stuff. He's the one that would let us at 12, 13 years of age get behind the steering wheel and drive his pickup over to the goat ranch. He's the one that would let us help feed the goats. He's the one that would uh, let us load the garbage in the back of the pickup and drive out to the dump and dump the garbage out. He's the one that, he did things with us. Which one do I remember and have more fond memories of? The one who did for or the one who did with? Loved them both. Make no mistake. But I, I have more memories of my grandfather because he did things with me. Guys, you got to be there. You got to do. Why? Because you got a purpose. You've got to remember the purpose. My page is all messed up here. What is our purpose? Are you raising children? No. They're already children. <laughs> you are raising adults. You are teaching children to become an adult. That is your purpose. That is your whole goal in life. Once you father a child, that's your job. That's, that should be your entire focus in life. What you want, what you desire, what you think you need, all goes by the wayside. Mamas goes for you too. That is your job in life. Everything you do, whether it's working at your job, whether it's you know, having a craft, having a hand, it's about raising and teaching those children how to become godly, God-fearing adults. That is our purpose. That is our job as a father. You know, a lot of men, most men, 
with a little bit of cooperation from a female can become a father, right? But it takes somebody extra special to be dad. And what is it that we can call God? Abba, Father, Daddy. We can call God Daddy. That love, that emotion, that that relationship that we can't have with anybody else. And we need to have that same kind of relationship with our children. Whether it's a boy or a girl, yes, it's easier to have a relationship with my son. I can take him out. Well, I can teach him how to twist a wrench and you know pull the spark plug out of the lawnmower and you know all those. But everything I do has to have a purpose. And that purpose is to teach that child a lesson so that when he becomes an adult, he will be a godly adult. You remember the song, long, long time ago, be careful little mouth what you say, be careful little mouth what you say, but the father up above is looking down with love, so be careful little mouth what you say. And the second verse is be careful little hands what you do, be careful little hands what you do, for the father up above is looking down with love. So be careful, little hands, what you do. God is talking to us fathers, is he not? Be careful, little mouth. Be careful, little hands, what we do. Because we are teaching and raising and training the next generation of adults that are going to honor God and serve God. That is our purpose. That is our goal. That is what? life is to consist of. That is our purpose in life. And we all like to have a purpose, don't we? Do we not? Now, some of you haven't had children. Some of you may never have children. But there's other children that you can still be a parent to, can you not? Amen. Whether it's here at the church or kids down the block, we are to be the parent. We're to teach them train them, to raise them, that they can grow and blossom and become godly people. Because if we don't teach them, as we were told in Deuteronomy, every opportunity, it's our job to teach them, to train them. That's why we're going to do vacation Bible school. That's why you do Bible readings at night. That's why you bring your children to church. That's why you live a godly life. That's why you say godly things. Watch your mouth. Watch your hands. Watch your life. That is your purpose. Fathers, it's a tough, tough job that we have. Yes, moms, I know yours is a tough, tough job too because you got to put up the bus. But that is our purpose. That is our purpose. Bring those children and raise them to be adults. Godly adults, just as Paul was trying to raise those Thessalonian Christians, new infant baby Christians, and teach them and train them to become mature, well-grounded, godly Christians. We are to do the same here. Do the same with our children. The second relationship that God <coughs> developed he developed first the relationship between us and him. Then he developed the relationship between a man and his wife and his children. So very important. Thousands of years later, then came the church. Okay? So a family relationship is extremely important. And each one of us have our roles to perform. There's some things only a guy can teach, right? How to scratch, how to spit, you know. <laughs> There's some things only a guy can do. Do it well. Do it with a purpose. And remember, everything you do is being watched. Not, <laughs> yes, God's watching everything you do, but there's blue eyes up there watching. Fathers, I encourage you today be the father that God's called you to be. Maybe you haven't 
always been the best. Maybe there's some things you're doing that you realize maybe you shouldn't be doing. Some things you're saying you shouldn't say. You need to get some things right this morning. Ask God for help to be the father that you need to be. You know, one thing I have noticed as my children have aged, they come to me less and less for help. You know, when they're Charlie's age, there's no break, is there? It's constant. You know, my children are up in their 30s now. They don't come as often, but you know the things they come with, whoa, they're getting heavier and heavier and harder and harder. And it doesn't ever end, does it, Harry? You never get to quit being a father. It just gets harder and harder. If you need to ask God for some help this morning, being the father that you need to be, now is our time. Would you stand with me as we pray? Our most gracious Father, God, we are grateful today that we can call you Father, that we can call you Daddy because you love us so much and you've displayed your love and you've shown us your love by sending Jesus Christ to die for us. And Father, we know that we are extremely imperfect when it comes to emulating you. But God, help us each and every day to strive to be all that we can be, to be the fathers that you've called us to be. We thank you for the responsibilities that you have entrusted us with. Those small, fragile lives to mold and to build and to develop. God, guide our hands, guide our mouths. Show us how to be and how to say exactly what we need to do in each and every service. Father, if there's anybody this morning that needs to come and ask you for help, let them come now. I ask all this in your precious name. Amen. 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 As we sing, if God's speaking to you this morning, now's the time to come. <laughs>